thank you everybody uh, for your patience. And we're running just a little behind, which I think is a good problem. I think that means that there's, there's a lot of content being shared. So, um, but we're excited now to uh, welcome a session titled Vernacular Painting from San Antonio's West Side. Our speakers are obviously joining us virtually and we're grateful that they're able to do so. We have Aite Victoria Suescom, originally from Panama. Suescom lives and paints in San Antonio since 1988. She serves as professor of art at Austin Community College since 2006. Last year, the McNay Art Museum showcased her work in folk pop, Victoria Suescom's Tianditas. Her work is inspired by Rotulos hand painted signage and has been exhibited in museums and galleries internationally, including the 50th Venice Biennale and biennials in Cuenca, Santo Domingo, and Panama. So Ascom's work is in the collection of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Panama and the Jordan Schnitzer Museum in Oregon, among others. Our other speaker is Christina Fraser. Fraser has been formally studying, formally studying signs since 2014, when she began systematically documenting signs around San Antonio after one of her favorite murals, fish swimming along the side of a pet shop, was tagged by a graffiti writer and then subsequently painted over by the business owner to a plain green color. Feeling an unexplainable sense of loss regarding the look of the city block and the aesthetics of the streetscape, her obsession eventually forced her back into graduate school to study neighborhood change and aesthetic values. It's really interesting. So I'll hand it over to you all, uh, and thanks again. You're open Thursday. Next. This presentation aims to introduce a genre of painted storefront signage, rotulos, found in San Antonio's west side. Outside mom and pop businesses, such as beauty parlors, carnicerias, fruterias, auto repair shops, and restaurants. Next. Christina. With this presentation, thank you. This presentation, we situate vernacular genre of art with characteristics that correspond with other discussions of painting addressed in this symposium. Thus far, this art has not recognized academic institutions. I've had an interest in sign since I was a child, but I grew up outside the tradition, the sign of the tradition of the we will be looking at today, which Victoria calls Tita painting. A lot of introduced basic characteristics of the sign. Next. Sorry about that. <laughs> Yeah, so this is an introduction to the basic characteristics of the signs. Next. Bienvenidos. I grew up without access to museums, but was surrounded by hand-painted signage found on the walls of mom and pop shops in Spanish-speaking portions of the Americas, such as Panama, Honduras, Costa Rica, Mexico, and San Antonio's West Side. The first time I ever saw an actual painter he was placing a sparkle on a drop of condensation on a six foot tall bottle of cold beer on the wall of a bar and I was 12 years old. In 1990, many years, that's about three decades later, I started photographing the genre, which I call tiendita painting. They may appear clumsy to some, but like the art painted on the walls of Lesco, it has recognizable characteristics. The Tiendita paintings emerge from a tradition that is consistent across time and geographical space. Inanimate objects are often presented in dynamic action. Here, the cold bottle sweats. Next. The type of vernacular art, this type of vernacular art is characterized by restricted color combinations, reversed perspective, fanciful shifts in scale, and awkward proportions. On the left, you see a screwdriver as large as a person with it. On the right, you see a shovel that has two long handles. These paintings are created as advertisement. Text is often included, but not necessary. 
the images may not be addressing a literate consumer. Next. In these examples, a car battery does not diminish in size as it gets further away. Neither do the legs of an ironing board. The ovals on an upright fan and a billiard ball don't center properly. The number seven appears full frontal as does the eye on a horse. Similar to a bull in the caves of Lascaux, its neck is too short. This horse could never eat grass. The head is tiny, the torso is elongated. Next. Like the sweating beer bottle, objects are often active. Dryers blow out the words, walk in. Electric cords wiggle, wind sweeps hair, swags at the end of the letter Z, ricochet, and deliver a punch. When text is present, the artist usually makes fonts with whimsy. Often, they combine upper and lower case inside single words, letters loop, and swagger across the walls. Next. Cars kick up dirt, dice are tossed, billiard balls karam, and break into flames. Next, Christina. So here are some pictures of some um, painters that work. Um, I drive around, find people painting, and take photos of them. Um, so I'll make an appointment and tag along. Uh, the upper uh, left hand photo, I'm at the brewery of eight flights of stories, um, watching some people do some work. So it's been part of the work, getting to know the people doing it. And there are all different sorts of people painting signs. Next. So we're going to look at three different sign stories in depth. Our first look is um, in-depth look series of Vernon signs is a tire shop in San Antonio's south side, Gomez Tire. I have these shots we're looking at in January 2016. After I got permission from the owner, I took over a dozen photos since the paint was fresh and white. And the most painted with detail. These photos are my very favorite. Please. Next. In this photo, and this is taken by Victoria this year, we can, in only two years, is fake healing. Many signers work with paint they can convert, Christina, or the paint. Christina, you're cutting out. Should I read? Okay. Better now? Christina, give it a try. Slide 12. Christina, pick Go it up. Ahead. In the next photo, and this was Victoria, we can see in only first the fading and painting. Okay. Mini um, sign paint. I, I'm going to pick up. Okay. These are Christina's words in the next photo, and this was taken by Victoria this year. We can see that in only five years, the paint is fading and peeling. Many sign painters work with the paint they can afford or the paint the business owners can afford. This painter used enamel, but it seems to have been interior enamel since it has not been able to withstand the Texas sun. Another contributing factor to a faded look is not actual fading, because lime is used in construction so much. And because San Antonio is a limestone town and there's lime dust in the air, this can actually run down walls and cling to paint if a protective coating isn't applied. This is another reason why the Gomez tire signs are fading. To prep the wall, use the best paint and then apply protective, protectant, these two, these two things drive up the price of production. Tire shops are often great places to find vernacular work. And Victoria will be talking more about tires in our next slide. Next. 
It's fascinating to recognize what the painters cared or knew to describe about their subject. The artist that painted Gomez tires on the right clearly understood treads and knowingly described them to drive over rough land or to prevent a vehicle from hydroplaning. The artist who painted the tire on the left indicates that treads in the center are different from treads along the edges, but beyond that had a wonderful, fun painting zigzags. I propose the artist on the left did not know a tire as intimately and had less formal academic training, but, and this is a big but, that uh, that artist does paint within a tradition, the Tiendita tradition. The treads are fanciful. The blades on the ring are all different sizes. The ring is out of proportion and does not center on the tire according to linear perspective. Next. These are Christina's words. Victoria and I found out while we were putting together th this together that there are two Frutetias Los Valles in San Antonio. The first one we are going to be talking about is the one on South Flores Street. This building was originally some sort of drive-in and its A-frame architecture is eye-catching from the street. On the left, we can see that the artist or artist made good use of this with the macro painting of the flag and fruit. I took this picture in, in 2015 and it faded softly over time, but still looked good for several years while the restaurant was vacant. Then as a new restaurant moved in, the painted over, they painted over the fruit with this orange color. I took this photo last week. It really doesn't seem the same to me. Now Victoria will tell you about the other Los Valles. Next. The Fruteria Los Valles on 3915 Nogalitos has tr also transformed itself over the years. It announces itself as Los Valles Produce, but I always hear it referred to as Fruteria Los Valles. Next. About two years ago, plastic banners with photographs replaced fabulous paintings as that you see here of aguas frescas and chili mangoes on a stick. The sidewalls, however, still display, next, original work such as Los Valles signature corn on the cob with cream and chili powder. Halos around objects are another characteristic of the Tiendita paintings. I have seen walls that were repainted with an effort made to preserve the objects. So a halo, the color of the original wall paint is created. As in the case of this corn on the cob, the halo is often created on purpose to strengthen perhaps the graphic effect. On the bottom right, you can see one of my paintings. As I create and recombine versions of the Tiendita paintings, I gain insight into what the artist might have been thinking. I learn. It is clear this artist had a sophisticated understanding of corn. The silks are carefully individuated by pale brush strokes, and the kernels are irregular in form and diminish in size as they reach the tip. They seem to me far more irregular than the kernels I would find, for example, on a GMO corn on the cob at HEB. Next. On the right side of the building, one still finds paintings of a molcajete, in the center and plates with animated flatware that on the left, for example, that I believe is as sophisticated as work by pastels by Luca Samaras. In other countries, one will find regional plates represented as well, but they'll be different, of course. So in Panama, you will find fried fish with patacones being very popular. Next. These are Christina's words. Sociedad fraternal lucha libre. Some sign painters are self-taught. Some are trained informally and some formally. Some began as taggers. Some paint signs, but also do fine art on the side. Almost all I have interviewed placed sign writing as lower on the art hierarchies, but I don't always agree. One day I was out driving around and saw this from the road. I couldn't see what was going on with the figures. So I pulled in the drive to look. 
I had no idea what it was. But when I got closer, I saw that there was a wrestling setup and that the paintings were of men in lucha libre masks. They're painted on plywood. These are close-ups of the lucha libre pics. I wound up taking some really great shots that day. The last time I went to take a look, I saw that they had replaced this wall with a new one, but I could see the old one with these paintings leaning up against the fence with the bottom part rotting. I have considered trying to buy the old ones, but I haven't worked up the courage. Next. This Lucha Libre tradition obviously is emerging out of Mexico. As earlier stated, this genre crosses geopolitical borders. Christina's words. Next. So when she saw my photographs on Instagram, she was inspired to create her own version of the Lucha Libre paintings. Next. Here, click twice. Here is a time lapse of video of Victoria creating a painting based on my documentation of Lucha Libre. Next, these are Christina's words. Next, hand painted signage is often painted over or fades over time. Increasingly, it is replaced altogether with mainstream signs as a result of gentrification, which has gained momentum on the West and south sides of San Antonio. I see and document the changes as part of my work. Now, more than ever, it is important that the mainstream become sensitized to this genre that is culturally bound to a people who are historically marginalized. It is Victoria's belief and mine as well that when people learn more about this art, they will value it more and thus show more interest toward the idiosyncratic and vernacular forms. Increased tolerance and accommodation of difference can help us navigate our current difficult political climate and lead to peace and conflict resolution. My words. My paintings may not appear political in content, but the minute I place images that are created with the characteristics of the Tiendita genre, I validate on purpose a community that is mine, that to which I belong. And I am convinced that to become familiar, to get to know a people breeds respect. It isn't enough to reduce violence it is necessary to actively work towards creating peace. Next. This is an image taken by Christina of a sign commissioned by her from one of the sign painters, her words. So please support your local sign painter. Next. And here are some of the people documenting signs on Instagram. And here are, you can, so you can follow Christina, you can follow Victoria, Fonda de Letras, Marito Perez for images from Mexico and the Rio Grande Valley, Plaqueta for images from Mexico, and Identica CR for images from Costa Rica. And I'm sure there are many more. Next. Here are some of the people documenting signs on Instagram. You can see three of their pages and you can see that the feeds are just full of these images in this particular genre. Thank you for being here today. Forgive us the technical glitches. Thank you, Christina.
for your wise words. And Christina, thank you. Thank you. And are there any questions? Are there any questions? Can't you can turn it off. We probably have a, a hot second for a, a question before we transition. We're, as you well know, we're, we're running tight on time. Um, and I think a lot of us took a picture of the screen to see where we can find you. Um, so we might, uh, you might receive some questions over email. Any quick responses or questions before we move to our uh, can you talk about your medium? Are you pretty much mimicking the same medium as the sign painters? So I'm going to repeat this question. This is for you, Victoria. Um, can you just say a little bit about your medium? Are you, what kind of painter are you using? Are you using the same kind of materials that, that the actual sign painters are using? I have created uh, paints on canvas using latex, which is wa literally wall paint. And those pieces traveled to Honduras to a conference called Mujeres en las Artes. And one of those pieces, that was in 1998. And today, one of those pieces is on exhibit at the next Blue Star fundraiser on October 7th. So, these, so I've been painting these for a long time, but the materials I use do change over time. And currently, I am enjoying working on enormous rolls of paper that I double fold over twice, roll with paint rollers, you know, glue. So they create a really thick surface. I patch them together. I add tabs, I build them up and they are curving and they create friction for the images to fit inside, you know, in a manner similar that the walls create friction for the sign painters. They have to struggle to put the images around windows and electrical boxes. So that's how I'm working. This is literally my newest work. It's super exciting. Thank you for the gorgeous images and the inspiring talk and the, and the call to action. Come come to Lubbock and paint signs. Lubbock doesn't have nearly enough of this visual stimulation. So bring it. <laughs> I want to thank you very much for having us. Christina, I want you to know, I did try to Christina's words with a deeper voice, as you can tell, her input is extraordinarily valuable. This presentation would have been impossible without Christina Frazier's contribution and her view of the of these images and insight. You know, just provides a whole other perspective. And together, I feel that we are just, at least myself. I am so happy to be collaborating with Christine and I thank her tremendously. Sounds like a beautiful partnership. Thank you so much. Okay, so we have one more. We have one more morning session. Um, and so I'll be welcoming to the stage Elaine Paulowicz and Rachel Black. Uh, their session is entitled Drawing from the Outside In and the Inside Out. Elaine Paulowix. Paulowix? I so apologize that I think I'm mispronouncing your last name. Short circuiting. Um, she received her MFA in painting from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in 1993 and studied under many Chicago imagists, including Jim Nutt, Barbara Rossi, Ray Yoshida, and Phil Hansen. Her work has been exhibited in numerous solo and group exhibitions nationally and internationally. She completed an installation of 12 large-scale paintings commissioned by the City of Chicago for Oriel Park Library. She has participated in numerous residencies in Wyoming, Montana, Newfoundland, Iceland, Ireland, New Zealand, Portugal, Australia, and Brazil. Elaine has taught college-level art for almost three decades, including at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, the University of Dayton and currently serves as Associate Professor of Art at the University of North Texas. She's been actively involved as an honorary summertime studio art assistant over the past seven years at Project Onward, a nonprofit Chicago-based organization and leader in the field of disability arts. Rachel Black holds an MFA from the University of North Texas. She has taught foundations and figure drawing at UNT since 2003. She was a crew member for the Saul LeWitt Mural Project at DFW Airport and created an original mural which is in the permanent collection of the Texas Forestry Museum in Lufkin, Texas. 
She has taught workshops at the Modern Art Museum in Fort Worth, was a staff member at the Amon Carter Museum of American Art, and has shown her work in exhibitions throughout Texas. She is principal lecturer in art at UNT. Welcome. Hello? Okay. Um, hi, my name is Elaine Polowitz, and this is my great colleague, uh, Rachel Black. And what we thought, we're going to go through this really quick because we know that it's lunch and you guys are probably just done. But um, at the end, um, I did bring original examples of some of the work, uh, the outsider artwork, so maybe during lunch. Uh, you guys can just kind of look and see how amazing this work is. But we, um, Rachel and I, I'm so blessed to have a colleague at work that, um, you know, that is so collaborative. We've been working together for 16 years. And, um, you know, a big part of our job, besides being artists, is being great teachers. And, and I really loved a lot of the things that were said earlier um, but this idea, we taught foundation drawing together for many, many years. And it's this idea um, throughout the whole uh, topics today about um, inclusion. And I, I just wrote a couple things, and I just wanted to quickly say this. Um, like Dr. Um, Heron, her thing was, what is? What is Texas art? And then you think about it, what is Texas, and then what is art? Those are huge questions. What is center, what is periphery? What is right and what is wrong place? What is provincial, what is globalization? What is academia and what is outsider art? What is um, neurodiversity? We see a lot of neurodiversity now in our classroom and this idea of being inclusive. Um, and, and also looking at like what Victoria and Christina were talking about, looking at marginalized uh, situations. Um, I also was listening to Michael Collins when he talked about how great artists are everywhere. Um, we are so fortunate that we have a very large art program and there are great students and they come from nothing and this is their first experience um, into academia. But I also, I think Rachel and I are very aware that they may not have been able to afford Afford, you know, the experiences of going to museums or affording to take art in high school. We have a very democratic uh, situation at UNT where anybody can be an art major. You don't have to have a portfolio before you come in. And so I, I just love the fact about UNT in that. Um, and also how um, Gus Capriva said that, you know, he mentioned how Great artists are also very influential teachers and really help the next generation, and, and I really feel that. Um, I also was thinking about how Carlos was talking about the influence of Pil Bill Commodore, and I was thinking about my own position in Texas art. Um, I also grew up in Texas, and um, Bill Commodore, I was referred to him, and I took him when he was a professor at uh, Brookhaven uh, Community College before he went to SMU. And he was extremely influential uh, for myself, even though I'm not an abstract painter. Um, okay, so with that, let's go ahead and get started. So um, I'm just gonna, let's see here, I'm very nervous. Uh, so 
what we're kind of thinking about is we're going to show in our presentation um, examples of academic drawing versus uh, the or having the antithesis with the outsider art. And really, this presentation is probably going to ask more questions than uh, create solutions. Um, so, Rachel, do you want to talk about the first? This was done in your uh, the foundations. Oh, okay, we can just move on. But anyway, so we're going to kind of loop back with into Bill Douglas and t talk a little bit about uh, this idea of looking at things within things, uh, pareidolia. Um, one thing, when I started working, um, how this kind of happened, um, I went, I got my degree um, in Chicago, and while I was there, there was um, one job that I had when I first got out of grad school was working for an organization called Gallery 37. And it was set up by the mayor, um, and it was for grade school and high school students. And what happened was um, students with disabilities, they aged out, and they had nowhere to go. So um, another colleague, he was not in my initial class, but he started, he also worked for Gallery 37, um, this idea of Project Onward. And so when I was, anyway, and it just made such an impact on me. And it, the group was in the cultural center downtown. And anyway, um, every time I would go to Chicago, I lived in Chicago for 17 years before I ended up coming to UNT, uh, and that was in 2006. Um, after I got tenured, I was a mess. And I was like, I have to figure out what, what it is that inspires me again. And so I wrote a letter to Project Honor, and I was like, I want to be a part of this because I've been a huge fan. I want to learn more. I see myself in the group because I think I have some neurodiversity as well. And it was the best thing ever. And so I've just continued. And um, so I, I just feel like I want to share. But it's really impacted my teaching as well. So on the left side, um, this was a resume by one of the artists. Uh, or it, it actually it was a resume and a list of things. But this idea how you can see there's an artistic creative impulse just in handwriting, which is part of drawing. And then on the right, I also brought this. There was an artist, and it was super interesting how these are like coding. Um, and she could see the message, but it was an incredible uh, neurological kind of thing. And so then I started looking at biology and how there's genetics and all of this. Um, and so we're going to just move into this idea um, going from drawing one and two into this antithesis. So I'm gonna. So I wanna start here with this image from um, one of our foundation students at UNT and all the work that we'll be showing um, for the point to Elaine's counterpoint from the outsider artists is um, from our foundation students at UNT. And this is a piece which um, is a response to the experience of visiting uh, the natural history collection we have at UNT. Um, so the students are engaging with the collection. And this student had a really active and rich um, sketchbook sort of habit. And um, this final piece is an effort to provide a glimpse into that sort of engagement that he um, experienced with the collection. Um, so I really love the idea of um, providing that glimpse to the viewer um, and that the piece is more about the process of that engagement than it is about a final um, response to it. So kind of the antithesis to this was, um, besides also working, um, I'm also a huge collector of work. And in Dallas, I ended up meeting um, someone and there's actually going to be a symposium at SMU next weekend on Miles for Freedom. It's an organization um, uh, that works with artists in, in prison. And anyway, so this was a, a one piece that I have that it, it's, was done by a prison artist. This idea of 
drawing what's right around you. Um, you know, these artists, just like the outsider artists, um, are limited to their um, um, to resources. So they, they use what they have. And I think our own art students do the same thing, you know, and, and so just with that. Um, another thing is that, and I think I have this example here, um, a lot of artists with disabilities don't have access uh, for various reasons. Either they can't get there or, um, anyway, so in the antithesis to uh, Rachel's uh, assignment, what this artist did um, was he created his own collection from the internet. And so he has his own museum that he's looking at. So the internet is, is actually a huge resource and that's something to think about too for our own students. Um, collecting things um, and making sense. We're all trying to make sense of what our world is. So a lot of times we don't have the privilege of experiencing all these exotic species. Um, and then um, this other artist here, this idea of, um, this is an artist. What happened was when I was working with Project Onward, I helped them get uh, into the Outsider Art Fair in New York. And that was a huge accomplishment. So they have had now a much more international exposure, which has helped their finances and you know their survivability. But this was an artist um, that I, I saw uh, that was represented at the Outsider Art Fair. And this idea of you know stream of consciousness, um, looking at like in terms of an artist's sketchbook, um, did we have another slide, Rachel? I think we, we lost one there. But in academia, we doodle a lot. We tell our students, draw in the sketchbook. But what's amazing with a lot of artists um, that are intuitive is that they're able to visualize very quickly and their doodles, like they have this amazing compositional element that, um, and it's, it's part of the way that the brain is wired. And so, um, Anyway, I think that just being kind of, you know, looking at both sides of it. So here's an example from Drawing One, a modulated contour exercise, um, working from life, um, using line to, um, I guess, understand and organize space. So I think a lot of times my students are thinking about line as being a flat way of, um, I guess, drawing or representing shape. Um, but the way that we are talking about um, line is a way to understand a 3D on the 2D surface. And, and this is an example of, you know, in foundations we would teach about, or teach what is a line. It goes from point to point. And, and this artist is at Project Onward, and I just thought that it's such a beautiful example of this idea of point and line and how this becomes something else that's super poetic that, you know, um, we're taught so much in academia to conceptualize and um, theorize in a sense, when really it's just these simple intuitive thoughts. And we have to validate our students' intuition just as much as teach them. So kind of working from both directions. For this example from figure drawing, um, a way to sort of um, contextualize the figure, um, not just as the sole subject, but a figure in space. And we want to really, t I mean, I like to talk about um, really considering format and not just subject. Um, so context is important in this uh, line drawing. And thinking about um, working from life, um, a lot of the artists at, at Project Onward, they don't have that kind of access. So, and we saw this last year in Zoom. Um, if any of you had to teach figure drawing remotely, um, having the Zoom figure, but then we couldn't have it completely nude because then the university could get in trouble with pornography. Um, but this artist here actually worked from pornographic sources. Um, and then kind of looking at the figure in terms of if looking at it more emotionally. So it's not this idea of drawing correct proportion. Um, it's another kind of feeling or narrative, kind of this dark angel. 
just an exercise that we were doing in drawing one as a, as a way to sort of um, process um, three-dimensional form into the flat shape. So it just continued our explorations of um, figure ground and an understanding of that in, in pursuit of a, a, a balanced, uh, via symmetry or asymmetry, uh, balanced composition. So kind of the antithesis, um, this is a botanical drawing um, done by Lucy Woodhouse. And this idea of positive and negative and how you could approach that where instead of working on, you know, with cut paper, you know, creating that negative with this, this obsessive drawing of the black with the pen, you know, and, and, and thinking about that idea of labor and it's almost like meditation or OCD, um, but thinking it's the same, it's positive and negative, but it's constructed, the process is completely different. And then here, uh, additive um, value drawing, um, as the students are working to understand, um, I guess, the six, six categories of light as an effort to um, to translate um, form onto the 2D surface. And so this was one thing that um, Rachel and I were kind of talking about where with the outsider art, it was much harder to find form um, as, you know, it, that's where it kind of diverged a lot. And so when I was at the outsider art fair, um, I saw this uh, drawing that was from um, China from an outsider artist. And what's interesting now is that the artist is working in a workshop, but you know the um, the ink process, the Chinese painting, is so technical. And so I have a feeling they were trying to work with the artists with disabilities, and they probably had different uh, proportions of ink set up, so they automatically would get different values. But then you could also see where the, um, the handwriting becomes different. So it just is interesting when you shift it globally into another context, and then you're also looking at technique uh, and, and how that form happens. I talk to my uh, foundation students a lot about how gesture is the foundation of everything. And for myself as a painter, I feel that that continues to be the case. Um, one of the ways that I talk to them about gesture is um, how the mark or the body of the artist, um, in a sense, is mediating um, observation into action. And that process which is happening um, between the body, um, the subject, and the mark. Um, and it really leads, um, it's also sort of an exploration, uh, again, of, of spatial awareness of ourselves in the world and how we're reacting to the subject. And these are just two examples where um, working with, you know, once again, these artists don't have access to the live models. So they're looking at themselves, they're looking at the inside rather than the outside. So this I idea of gesture is coming from a very different place rather than observation, it's coming from inside. Um, this was from uh, Pure Vision in New York. Uh, and then on the right side, this was from uh, KCAT in Ireland. So that's one thing too, that there are centers for artists all over the world, uh, artists with disabilities. And so that's been something, when I go on residencies, I'm kind of looking at that as well, because I've just learned a tremendous amount by uh, you know, looking at non-traditional sources. This is a really strong charcoal drawing um, of a model um, from life um, one, that one of our students created. And one of the things I, I preach to them um, when we're working with the figure is about uh, specificity. And so I see this as an example of the gesture sort of being married with those studies of value and coming to a place of, um, of specific observation and recognition of, of this individual. Um, and I paired it with this because I thought it was interesting. This artist um, works with obituaries. 
So once again, this idea that they don't have access to the live model. And, and I think that it's super creative um, to really honor people that have passed and using that as a, as a resource. And so, um, and thinking about gesture in this completely different way. So I have some examples um, uh, from David Holt. So we um, continue um, to talk um, in foundations about um, linear perspective um, as a means by which to sort of understand um, that translation uh, between 3D onto the 2D surface. And um, this is just, you know, once again, just a different kind of slant of that where, once again, these artists are not working from life. Um, they're actually working from photos. But you can see that this idea of photorealism um, is, is completely amazing. So um, Andrew Hall is an artist in Chicago. Um, he actually was commissioned to do one of the subway stops. Um, and these are very, very tiny drawings. So they're like uh, three inches by four inches, but they're super meticulous. So recently at UNT, we've uh, reimagined our foundations program. So we're not teaching um, drawing one um, as I've been describing thus far um, any longer. And the new class I'm teaching is called Space. And I, I thought that this fit in nicely because we're introducing digital tools um, to our foundation students, but not necessarily having them applied in that traditional manner that I just showed. Um, this is a, a isometric rendering um, of a memory model. So it's not necessarily supposed to function um, as a space that we would be familiar with, being able to walk inside. It's actually an imagined space. So we're giving them a little bit of, um, I guess, freedom to explore um, that language of architecture in a manner that um, really gets to a deeper meaning. Um, and kind of a counterpoint to that, uh, Kareem Davis um, is an artist that um, started working just on newsprint. Um, he worked as a dishwasher and his employer uh, brought him to Project Onward and he, was, he first started drawing um, project housing that he was living in and all around. Um, now he is showing at Western Exhibitions in Chicago, which is an internationally known gallery. Um, so this idea of taking, you know, there, there's more of an, an inclusivity, um, but this idea of space and how that um, operates even though this is very flat. And I love the idea of how within this regiment of lines, there's still kind of these organic lawn chairs. Um, so, and then now he's putting in, instead of the sun, um, he's adding the moon. And I think there's like really slow little poetic features that happen in his drawings. Um, the other thing is that um, look, Ricky Willis, um, this is one of his drawings at the top. Some artists work better, and in terms of drawing, working with 3D. Um, and I think that that's super interesting. So he really, um, he isn't able to drive. He, he knows every single water tower in the city of Chicago um, through Google Maps. So he drives himself through, and then he's able to uh, look at how this all fits, and he creates uh, these models. It, it's pretty amazing. Um, and so thinking about our students too, you know, they may have a really hard time drawing, but they may have a really amazing idea with space. And so just being aware that these things can happen. Um, these are two brothers that are at Project Onward, and it's amazing. They're both on the autistic spectrum. One really focuses on uh, these very uh, meticulously detailed 2D drawings. Um, and then his brother works completely 3D. So, um, and building these amazing models. Um, and so it's just super interesting how the brain works. And I think that there's a lot more to uncover. And then these are just, this, we just have two more slides and we're done. 
Um, so this idea of gestalt. Yeah, I wanted to bring uh, the end back to the beginning, um, in a sense, because the first image I showed was um, that sort of collage sketchbook process drawing. Um, this is from the same experience of working from the um, Natural History Museum. If you look closely, you can see the sort of the, the image of a skull, um, an animal skull um, presented. And this is where, to me, it gets really interesting that the students can begin to internalize and sort of um, work from that skill set that we've provided and taken it beyond observation um, into a place um, where they're really exploring and with still with an idea towards um, how that um, image is composed. And, and honestly, I think this is the hardest thing that we try to teach our students is how do they take the skills and then validate themselves that they can compose innovatively um, and not be afraid and take those risks. And it, it's so much work. Um, and so we'll just end with this, with this idea of gestalt. Um, there's a term called uh, pareidolia where um, they used to think, a lot of people have this, but at one time it was considered a sign of mental illness if you could see things within things. Um, but it's our normal part of our brain to, you know, part of our survival is that we, we wanna see the figurative. I mean, that's who we are, is we're figures. And so we're gonna project the figure in there. And so I think that we, um, we can tap into that as artists and instructors. Um, but it's also, uh, my mother was, she's, she's in almost 90, she's still, uh, tutors math, but she's an amazing mathematician and really interested in this idea of fractal patterns, scene patterns. And I think that intuitive artists, they just absorb what we already have as part of the earth um, and allow that raw vision to happen. Um, so on the left, this is um, a painting from Australia. It's an owl. And you can see that this idea of repetition, I mean, there's a lot of complexities here and it's d just done so freely. Um, and you can also see culturally how the Aborigines uh, dot paintings also, uh, you know, cultural, like what we look at, it also becomes part of the art. And then um, Bill Douglas, uh, he's one of the artists, he's my age, um, really tremendous artist. And, you know, he has no plan when he starts these. It just happens and it's incredible. And um, to allow our students to just take risks. And, you know, sometimes it, it may take a hundred times. And we all know that. It may take a thousand times before we hit the jackpot in there. But um, so with that, thank you very much. Um, I know everybody's probably starving. But I can stay up here and you guys feel free to look through any of the artwork. And you can ask questions if you want. You can come up. Um, but thank you so much. <laughs>